In Gen V, you've got Marie, who's a suit. She discovered her powers when she was a teenager, and what her power is is she can control blood once it's out of the body. Unfortunately, when she discovered this, she kind of killed her parents, because who knew you could weaponize blood? After killing her parents, she had to leave her little sister behind and be put into the Red River Institute. But she's got bigger aspirations than Red River. She's applied to a place called Godalkin University. It's a very prestigious college, specifically for kids with soup power. In fact, everybody from the Seven went to Godalkin. Getting into a place like Godalkin could keep her out of where she probably would be headed next, which is a, quote, rehab center up in Elmira, but in reality, it's a prison. That's where they send the kids that have soup powers, that don't get adopted, that end up aging out of the system. The good news for Marie, she gets into Godalkin. In fact, she gets a full ride. Before she goes off to Godalkin, her guidance counselor tells her, look, I'm happy for you, but you have to understand, you can't screw this up. If you do, you'll probably end up in Elmira, and that place is not like here. Marie isn't planning to mess it up, though. Marie is planning on joining the Seven in Vaught Tower. Now, Godalkin is led by their dean, Indira Shetty. But the guy that Marie wants to impress is someone named Rich Brinkeroff. He runs the criminal justice part of Godalkin. There are really just two majors you can take at Godalkin, criminal justice and performing arts. In criminal justice, you go off and you fight crime. You have a chance of becoming one of the members of the Seven. If you go into performing arts, you have a chance at a CW show. Since Marie was in foster care and they didn't have the CW, she has aspirations of becoming a criminal justice major and learning under Rich Brinkeroff, a guy whose books she's read inside and out. She feels like under his guidance, she will be the first black woman in the seven. It's just a matter of time. In order to do that, though, you have to be in the top 10 of Godalkin because most of the former and the present members of the seven were at one point in the top 10. Hey, if you don't end up making the seven, though, it's okay. You can go and protect a city and get a government contract for it. When Marie steps foot on Godalkin's campus, she's got hope and promise just pouring out of her. She's got her dorm room. She meets her roommate, Emma, who superpower is she becomes that of a very, very, very small human, like bigger than Ant-Man, but not much bigger. Emma's in performing arts, and she has a YouTube channel called Little Cricket. She seems fun, and her and Marie get along pretty quickly. They start talking about their background, but the thing is, Marie isn't ready to open up to anybody about what happened when she was 12. Understandable. You're not going to come right out and say, oh, I discovered my powers, and I killed both my parents. So she just plays it off like she came from a normal home. The first thing they decide to do together is go to a Godalkin University workout, because the number one ranked guy, the golden boy, will be working out. And his stuff is the workouts of legends. His soup power is he can instantly turn into flames. But this gives Marie a chance not only to see the number one ranked guy, but also all of them. All of the top ten are down there working out, trying to hone their skills. And Marie has aspirations of being down there one day with them. Right after the golden boy just tears his opponent a new one, Emma reacts because her phone just dinged and the class schedule's out. But when Marie checks her class schedule, there's one class missing. Intro to crime fighting. It's essential to her and her path in order to get in that class. So she goes to check on the mistake. She talks to Brink's TA, the number two ranked person in the class, named Jordan. And Jordan gives Marie a cold, hard dose of reality. It wasn't a mistake. She didn't get in because she's simply not big enough. Most of the people getting into that class have already solved homicides or they have a big following. Marie has done neither. Now, Marie pleads her case, but Jordan isn't budging. And that's when a stroke of luck ends up intervening because Brink comes out of his office to test Jordan's power. He does that by shooting Jordan with a gun and Jordan just simply flicks the bullet off. Because Jordan seems to be impenetrable. Oh, and also, he can switch genders from a girl to a boy, pretty flawlessly. Marie, though, takes this opportunity to shoot her shot with Brink herself, explaining that she read all of his books, she needs to be in this class, but Brink simply says, you know, performing arts is a fine program. 
and sending her on her way. Marie's pretty depressed about this, so she decides to start just walking around campus aimlessly. And as she's doing that, this kid frantically runs right by her. Maybe the reason he's running is because there are sirens in the background. But Marie's curiosity gets the best of her, and she chases after him. While doing so, she sees that this kid isn't just going for a run. He's destructive. Extremely strong and just chucking people and cars to the side. Marie decides maybe this could be her chance to be a crime fighter. So, using a knife, she cuts open her hand and then uses the blood to trip him. She ends up getting joined by another member of the top ten, a guy named Andre, whose superpower is he's basically Magneto. He can move metal around. And Andre traps this kid, and the police take him away. But what's interesting is neither Andre or Marie have ever seen this kid before. And as the kid was being taken away, he was screaming, I'm not going back to the woods. What they don't know is this kid isn't being sent to the woods. He's being sent to a room that he can't get out of, which has one window. And all he can see out of it is wallpaper of trees. So he calls it the woods. The next day, she talks to Emma about it. Emma's actually jealous of the encounter. At Cadalkin, she's never had anything like that happen. But they also brush it aside when they see some other students who major in performing arts that Emma wants to buddy up with. They start discussing their resumes and what they've appeared in, but all the kids at the table recognize Emma from something, and then it dawns on them, wait, you're little cricket. Emma gets a little self-conscious about this. Maybe to her it's a little embarrassing when the person you're talking to is in movies and you're just doing YouTube videos, but the kids seem really cool about it. In fact, the one kid, Liam, is a huge fan. Fortunately, Marie is not. These people just aren't really her crowd, so she gets up and walks off. While trying to find her way back to her dorm, she gets approached by Andre. They discuss their weird encounter the night before, and then Andre invites her out that night. He's heading out with a couple of the other members of the top ten, and he figured that she could tag along. The thing is, it's not exactly sanctioned. They're sneaking out. And Marie, not wanting to get in trouble, declines his invitation. She just doesn't want to risk being expelled. Andre understands, but also gives her the address of where they're meeting up later that night as she changes her mind. As those two were talking, Golden Boy, whose actual name is Luke, was busy talking to Professor Brink because Golden Boy is heading to the Seven. With Starlight quitting and Queen Maeve dead, they've got some obvious openings going on with the Seven, and it's been approved. The Golden Boy will be selected. Brink had been molding Golden Boy for a while for this opportunity, so he gives him a hug. But as Luke is hugging Professor Brink, he hears something. A voice calling his name, and he gets a little spooked. He's going to brush it off, though, and pop off and celebrate that night with his other friends, Andre, Jordan, and Luke's girlfriend, Kate. Kate's superpower is if she touches you with her hand and just says something, you're going to do it. That's why she wears gloves all the time. But before they leave, they end up getting joined by Marie, who is convinced by Emma that that's something you have to do. Joining that collective for a night out, that's a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. That, though, meant Emma was home just perusing her YouTube comments, and they weren't very kind. But she ends up getting hit up by Liam, that, quote, big fan, and they end up hooking up. But Liam, though, does have a fetish with Little Cricket. He wants her to get really small and play with the tail. And Emma's okay with it, it's just getting small isn't easy for her. She's got to strip down and vomit. It's pretty uncomfortable. But it gets Liam's rocks off. And while Emma was doing all of that, Marie, Golden Boy, Andre, Kate, Jordan, they snuck off to the roof of Seven Tower. Most of them are doing cocaine. Marie, though, is not. She's just kind of marveling at the view when Golden Boy comes up and talks to her. Start talking about Marie's background a little bit, and then she starts going on about a fabricated story regarding her family, but she stops herself and says, no, I'm, I'm lying. My parents are dead. The whole reason she came to Godalkin is to prove to her sister that she's not a monster. Luke can commiserate because his brother died. But this isn't a night to be sad. This is a night to celebrate because Luke lets everybody in on his secret that he's headed to the Seven. The group heads off to a club, they start enjoying the night, and then the drugs start kicking in. For Luke, he starts hearing that voice again, and then he starts seeing some trees. But for Luke, this isn't a first-time thing. 
He's been having a recurring dream regarding woods and trees. He doesn't know what it means, but to have it happening in a club, that is a first time. So he's kind of a mess. They all, though, are in a big mess when Andre ends up killing a woman. It was an accident. He was hitting on another woman, trying to impress her with his skills, when somebody bumped into him and he could no longer control the metal object that he was controlling. Andre rushes to the woman's aid because he can tell that he hit an artery, but Jordan gets in his ear and says, we got to get out of here now. The group starts leaving, but for Marie, she can't leave. When she looks down at that woman, she sees her mom. But unlike what happened to her mom, she now knows how to control her powers. And Marie ends up saving this woman's life by putting the blood back into her body. And it's all documented because everyone's recording it. She's feeling pretty good about herself until the next day, Brinkoff calls her to his office to let her know that while what she did was great, she has to take the fall for the others. Because the others ultimately will go on to do great things and save a lot of lives. But they can't do that if word gets out that they were high on drugs and killed somebody. And because she's really a nobody coming from foster care, doesn't have a resume, she's unfortunately going to be taking the fall for this and thus getting expelled from school. Now, she pleads her case to Brinkoff, but he doesn't really care. He just looks at her as a casualty. And she's really upset about it as she leaves the office. But as she's leaving the office, Luke ends up arriving. Because he woke up that day having the same dream that he had been having. Suddenly, he goes from his dorm room to a forest, and he sees his little brother who passed away. His little brother told him, it's not a dream, it's real. Please, help me. So Luke decided to go help him. He went to Brink's office, gave him a hug, and then set him on fire. He was probably going to get away with it, but he doesn't because Marie comes back. She wasn't willing to take no for an answer from Brink, and she wanted to plead her case again. But when she opened the door to see that Brink was dead and the golden boy was the one who did it, she is surprised. Luke starts pleading his case to her, saying, I had to. You don't understand what Brink did. You don't know about the woods. The fact that he brought up the woods definitely piques Marie's interest, but in that moment, she's terrified, and she'll tell him anything he wants to hear. Luke realizes, however, that letting Marie go is a mistake, so he starts to chase after her. Marie's able to get away because Jordan steps in, and the two end up getting in a pretty heated fight. When Luke makes his way outside, Marie is hiding behind Andre, saying he killed Brink. And at first, Andre doesn't believe it, but looking at his friend, he knows something's not right with him. Unlike with Jordan, Andre is able to calm Luke down, and Luke gives Andre a hug and cries, saying, I'm sorry. But then, he goes up into the sky, and he combusts. In episode two, the grieving period begins for most of the students involved with Golden Boy's untimely death. But inside the university, there's an emergency board meeting to deal with it. It includes Ashley from Vaught. They start contriving this narrative that it was Andre and Marie who actually fought off Golden Boy. They're completely ignoring Jordan. The reason they're not including Jordan in this is because a bi-gender Asian doesn't exactly sell in Southern America. They also plan on using this to their advantage by holding a Brink Gala, which will hopefully bring a whole lot of money into the university. Right before she hangs up, Ashley asks Indira if she could hop off speakerphone, and she just asks simply, does this have to do with the woods? And Indira says, it's not clear yet. A few hours later, Marie gets back to her dorm room, but she's still shook by the actions, and she's blaming herself. Emma immediately tries to console her, but Marie is inconsolable. She doesn't want to talk to anybody. She doesn't want to be around anybody. The next day, though, she finds out that her whole world has changed, but for the better. People are coming up to her, asking her for selfies, and she's curious as to why. And finally, one of them breaks the news that she is in the top 10. She's the first freshman ever in the top 10. She's ranked number 8. Andre is the new number 1, and Jordan has slipped all the way to number 5. That's a pretty big gut punch for Jordan, who's also mourning the loss of her mentor, Brink. Unlike most of the people on campus who's just doing it for social media clout, Jordan actually did care about Brink. Because Brink was the only person who didn't see them as a bi-gender Asian, like everybody else in Vaught Tower. Brink saw Jordan's skills, and that's all that mattered to Brink. So this is an especially tough day for Jordan, but it's also a really, really tough day for Kate. She just lost her boyfriend. Right now, to get through this tough time, 
People like Kate, Jordan, and Andre, they have to rely on each other. Marie, though, is getting used to this newfound celebrity status. She meets Jeff, Godolkin's social media director, and the first thing he does is hand her a cell phone, because Marie didn't have one of those. But he also lays out all the new features that come with being in the top ten. There's a lot of perks, and they're all in her dorm room. Marie, however, is very confused as to why all of this is happening, and Jeff says, well, you, you fought Golden Boy. And Marie corrects him and says, no, I, I didn't. But Jeff says, oh, that's cute. It's humble. Yeah, people love humble. Keep being humble. But come on, follow me. We have somewhere to be. The two are heading off to a photo shoot where Andre is already there with his dad. His dad is a famous alumni at Cadolkin. Andre, being a second generation and also being the number one ranked student, is a big deal to Andre's dad, who, by the way, goes by the name Pilardi. And Pilardi is way more excited about Andre being number one than Andre is, because Andre is still shook by something that Luke said to him right before he went up to the sky. He said, your dad has it. And Andre just doesn't know what that means. He tries to ask his dad, hey, did Luke say anything or give anything to you? But his dad is just as confused as Andre is. The difference is his dad doesn't care about what Luke said. His dad is focused on the future with Andre in the seven. The photo shoot is interrupted when Marie finally comes to the door. And this is the first time Marie is finding out about a photo shoot, but she's also finding out that she's going to be interviewed on national television along with Andre. It's a lot different than she thought it would be. They literally have a script for her to say. She rolls with it, though. She gets up there. She stands in front of the camera. She does her photo shoot with Andre. It goes great. Once they get out of there, Andre asks Marie what exactly Luke said. And she says, he just said the woods. It seemed really manic. And Andre reveals to Marie about the whole, your dad has it line. He doesn't know what it means, but he also doesn't understand why Luke would do what he did. None of it makes sense to him. Andre wants Marie's help with all of this, but Marie says, I don't know you. And it starts a little bit of a fight between the two. Andre thinking that Marie should help and Marie being like, no, I was about to get expelled before all this happened to me. And it ends with Marie just storming off. When she gets back to her dorm room, though, she gets an alert on her phone and her class schedule has been changed. She's now in school of crime fighting, the school that she wanted to be in. Not only that, she's been advanced to the junior level courses. She's now in class with Jordan, Andre, and Kate. While all of them are still mourning and sad, this is the happiest Marie's ever been. When she gets out of class, though, Jordan pleads to her to tell the truth. Marie starts telling Jordan that she doesn't owe him anything, and he says, no, I'm aware of that, but I'm asking anyway. When you get interviewed, please, just say what actually happened. You're live on camera. Whatever story you tell them, they have to run with. It gives Marie a lot to think about. Marie getting into crime fighting, though, it means that she doesn't attend the Intro to Auditions class in the theater program. And that was a class she would have had with Emma. Emma, though, does see a familiar face in the crowd. It's Liam, the guy she hooked up with. And when the group is supposed to break up into partners, she thinks, oh, this is obvious. I'll partner with Liam. She finds out that Liam has moved on to other interests. Emma ends up partnering with Justine. She was the really, really popular girl at the table that day, the one that had been to a bunch of auditions and been in a bunch of things. She's kind of like the queen bee. And not only does Emma partner with Justine, but Justine comes to Emma's defense with the whole Liam situation because she's known Liam for a while, and she figured something like this might happen. When they get back to Emma's dorm room, they start discussing what scene of a movie they want to reenact. And Emma is picking a bunch of movies with a big person and a really, really small person because that's her superpower. And Justine says, I didn't pick you because of that. I picked you to learn from. You've got a million followers on YouTube. I can barely crack 10,000. I myself have been typecast. I'm not going to do that to you. They then start getting into the process of Emma shrinking down. Emma doesn't tell a lot of people this, but she tells Justine that in order to do it, she has to throw up. Every time she throws up, she gets a little bit smaller. She's starting to lose the enamel on her teeth. It's not a fun thing to do for her. Unfortunately, a few hours later, Emma finds out that that was a mistake because Justine uploaded a video on her YouTube channel telling everybody about Emma's secret. She does so with this facade of female empowerment and not giving in to society's definition of beauty. But now the whole school knows Emma's secret and she's furious. When she goes and approaches Justine about this, Justine plays dumb. 
saying what? That was a secret? I had no idea. Emma, though, is devastated. In that moment, Emma could really use her roommate, but Marie is busy with the dean. The dean wanted to meet with her after everything that happened and get to know her. And the first thing she tells her is, before I was a dean, I was actually a behavioral psychologist. Marie, though, is not interested in discussing her life with Godalkin's version of Dr. Phil, but the dean persists. She asks Marie, why do you even want to be a superhero? And Marie says, it's my sister. She got adopted, I don't know where. I've been looking for her, and maybe with enough money I can find her. Maybe we can be a family again. When they wrap up, the dean looks at Marie and says, I like you, I just want to help you, and then sends Marie on her way. But then the dean goes down to the basement to check on the kids in the woods, and one of those kids is Sam, Luke's brother, who's undergoing some kind of procedure, and she just reminds him that every time he tries to leave, he only hurts himself. Now, two people that are trying to get to the bottom of what happened to Sam's brother are Andre and Kate. They head over to Luke's dorm room, but all they find is that it's been absolutely cleaned out and smells like disinfectant. It's really weird. As they walk through the quad trying to figure out what it all means, Andre has a eureka moment. When Luke said, your dad has it, he didn't actually mean Andre's physical dad. He meant the statue of Andre's dad that's at Godolkin University. Using his power, Andre creates a hole in the statue, and sure enough, There's a cell phone hidden inside. When they get back to the dorm room, they look at the cell phone and there's a video from Luke. Luke acknowledges that if anyone else is watching this, then crap hit the fan. He starts telling who's ever watching that there is a place underneath the school they call the woods. It's like a messed up hospital. His brother, who reportedly committed suicide, is there. He's not dead. They did stuff to him and they did stuff to Luke. And Brink was a part of it. He made this message right before he went in to talk to Brink because he was going to demand his brother back. But obviously, that didn't happen. This is a lot for Andre to take in. And he doesn't even really have time to process it because he has to get to the interview. On his way there, though, curiosity gets the best of him. He walks right by where his friend died, and he decides to make a little pit stop into Brink's office. Using his powers, he's able to open up Brink's laptop. And sure enough, there is a file on Sam, Luke's brother, and it even gives a location of where Sam is. Turns out, everything Luke said checks out. Andre is almost caught by a bunch of soldiers with guns, but it turns out they weren't looking for Andre. They were just showing up to take the hard drive. As Andre was trying to sneak out of the building, he has to stop on the stairwell because he hears the soldiers turn back when a janitor runs into them. And Andre is shocked because these guys kill the janitor. Andre then actually is caught, but luckily it's Kate who saves him using her powers, although Kate is absolutely spent, and she collapses into Andre's arms because she's having a seizure. Now, this whole time, Andre's dad was trying frantically to get in touch with him, but no luck. That means that they had to do the interview with just Marie. And Marie was planning on telling the truth, saying how Jordan was involved, but she was thrown off right before the interview happened by the person interviewing her because she mentioned Marie's sister and how they found her, but Marie's sister wants nothing to do with her. This shakes Marie to the core, and then the cameras go live. Marie freezes up, but then all of a sudden, she just sticks to the script, saying how Andre and her had to fight off Golden Boy, they had no choice, never mentioning Jordan whatsoever. She shines for Vaught, but after the interview, she goes and pays the dean a visit and says, did you know? And the dean says, of course not, and gives her a hug. But the dean's face tells another story. In episode three, when Marie gets back to her dorm room, she doesn't see Emma anywhere, but she can hear her. She can hear Emma calling for help, and Marie starts looking around, and there's Emma, as small as Marie has ever seen her. Emma is really, really struggling, and Marie gives her food. And that's how Emma gets bigger, is just simply by eating. Once Emma is normal size, she comes clean to Marie about how exactly she goes about getting small. And Marie's concerned for her. But Emma's had a really long day. She was just fighting off a bunch of ants to stay alive. She doesn't really feel like being told a PSA at the moment. She goes to the Cliff Notes version of her life. That, yes, her mother knows. Yes, she's in control. And truthfully, it's not a big deal. But Marie doesn't see it like that. She starts suggesting that Emma talk to somebody, maybe get some help for this. 
and Emma fires back, you cut yourself. That's your power. Well, this is my power. So you know what? Let's do what you talked about. Let's just go back to being roommates. Both girls turn over and they go to bed. But in a dorm room not too far away, Andre returns to Kate, and he's trying to get her to regain consciousness. She eventually does, but when she was out, she was having a dream from a few years ago where her and Luke went to go visit Sam. At that point, Sam was at a place called the Sage Grove Center Psychiatric Hospital, and he was going crazy based on Compound V being in his system. While Luke got awesome powers, Sam got some powers, but as he puts it, he also got a messed up brain. That memory goes away, though, once Kate regains consciousness and she's just spent. This sort of thing's happened before, she just needs her medication, but Andre's legitimately concerned. Much like Emma, Kate kind of brushes it to the side. Andre then focuses on how everything Luke said was true and how they have to get Sam out. But Kate says, how? I mean, you go in there and you're good to get caught. She just doesn't see an avenue where this ends well for them, even if they use their powers. Kate tells Andre to drop it. Andre doesn't want to drop it. But their hormones, folks, they're racing. So they end up hooking up that night. The next day, most of campus is getting ready, though, for the Think Brink fundraiser. Most of the top 10 students are going in some fashion. Now, most of them are going with their parents, who they don't have great relationships with. Marie is going at the behest of the dean, who invited her over for breakfast that morning. Dean makes her chocolate chip pancakes because that's what her daughter used to love. Turns out the dean had a daughter. And then pitches her on coming as her guest in order to kind of curry some donations. The night of the event, Marie ends up showing up and she's basically paraded around like a show pony. She's also getting dirty looks from Jordan. Jordan's not happy with what Marie did during that interview. In fact, neither is Kate. For Jordan, it's personal. For Kate, it was the fact that Marie was talking like she knew Luke when she actually didn't. But Jordan's also had a pretty rough day. Jordan's parents came down to escort them to this fundraiser. And Jordan doesn't have a great relationship with his dad. Because his dad has always looked at Jordan as a boy. Never a girl. It seemed like Jordan's father just had trouble accepting the fact that his son was by gender. Jordan's father thinks that the only reason Jordan switches over to a girl is to piss him off. But that couldn't be farther from the case. So Jordan's not getting accepted by his father, and he's also not getting accepted by the board of directors who choose the top 10, because Jordan's numbers just aren't good enough anymore, even though he is the best student at Godalkin. Jordan, though, isn't the only person that has a rocky relationship with her parents. So does Emma. Emma's mom, Tiffany, shows up to escort her to the gala, and she's a bigwig in the TV industry. And she's also okay with exploiting her daughter's eating disorder. Emma's mother introduces her to Courtney, a senior producer at Vaught who's into reality television. Emma's mom has pitched Courtney on a reality show focused on Little Cricket. But it isn't a feel-good show. It's more of a, man, the story you didn't know, the secret she was hiding, her eating disorder. The way that both of these adults talk about Emma's eating disorder is extremely cavalier. And Emma's worried about being that open with the public. But to Courtney and to Emma's mom, it doesn't seem like that big of an issue. Emma ends up excusing herself to go to the bathroom, and that's where she runs into Emma. Both girls apologize to each other. They say how they want to be friends. They give each other a hug. And Emma's feeling way better about the situation when she exits the bathroom. She returns to the table with Courtney and Tiffany, and she just has a couple of ideas for this proposed show. She doesn't want it to be like this expose on a girl with an eating disorder. She wants to be more like Queen Maeve. And her mom laughs at her, saying, Honey, you're not Queen Maeve. It's at that moment that Emma brings up how if this TV show were to go down, she would be exploited, but her mom brushes it to the side. And that's when Emma turns to Courtney and says, did you know that she taught me how to throw up? She then stands up, looks at her mom, and says, go fork yourself. Sorry, folks, I'm trying to keep the ads on here. Emma goes outside to grab some air, but as she's going outside, she catches the eye of another person who's dealing with parent issues, Andre. Andre was dragged to this thing by his father, who is not pleased. He's pissed off at Andre that he missed the interview. Andre told his dad that he simply overslept. That's the reason why, and he'll make it up to him at this gala by just shaking hands, kissing babies, and making sure that everybody there knows that he should remain number one at the school. But when Andre sees Emma step outside, he decides to do the same thing, telling his dad he's just going to the bathroom. 
As he's heading out, though, he runs into Kate, who he wasn't expecting to see there. Turns out she's not with her parents. She just bought a ticket. She did show up, though, to see Andre. She wants to talk about the whole hooking up situation, and he tells her we'll do it later, just not now. He goes outside to find Emma. He had been looking for Emma because he needs Emma. Somebody who can get that small would be perfect for getting Sam out of the woods. He shows Emma the video. He then shows Emma the proof that what Luke's saying is real, and Sam is, in fact, under the school. And then he pitches her the idea that she gets small because if he goes in there, he's going to get caught. But as soon as he says it, he regrets saying it because he realized that he's putting somebody in the theater program at risk. She's not ready for this. She hasn't been trained for it. But Emma is certainly down. The two quickly head over to the stairwell where the men with guns were. Luke gives Emma a tracking chip, and then Emma shrinks down. That way he can follow her. He tells her that he'll see her in an hour, and then he heads back to the gala so his father doesn't get suspicious of where he went. Emma's able to get into Sam's room by sneaking on his food tray. Sam, however, quickly notices that there is not something right with the food tray. There's a little person on there. Now, initially, he can't quite figure out why this small person is in his room, and he's shocked when Emma says, it's because of you. I was sent here to scout ahead. But to Emma's surprise, Sam doesn't want to go. He starts making the case that he's actually comfortable in this room because he's got a beanbag chair and they're cool. But he also mentions how he's tried to escape before it never ends well. His mood, though, changes when Emma says, your brother sent me. He looks at Emma and says, well, then I guess I'll give you all the codes to the security doors because I know them all. Now with the security codes in hand, Emma just has to wait for the orderly to come back and collect a tray of food so she can get out of there. Back at the gala, though, Andre returns, and unfortunately, his dad noticed how long he was gone. He can tell that something is distracting Andre, so he finally says, what is it? You mad at me or something? And Andre says, no, I'm actually trying to be a superhero. Something isn't right. There's some kind of secret hospital underneath the school where they keep everybody. And Andre's dad just hugs him, but he does so to get close to his ear. He asks Andre, who else did you tell about this? And Andre lies and says, nobody. And his dad says, well, then don't tell another soul about this. You're going to get yourself killed. And it's at that moment that Andre realizes his dad knew about this the entire time. This is a pretty shocking revelation to Andre. It's not the only shocking revelation that goes down in the room, though. After being paraded around all night, Marie's kind of sick of it. She goes to leave. She gets stopped by Jordan, who just starts insulting her. And Marie's not in the mood. Her and Kate don't care. They keep going in. But when Jordan mentions how Marie is probably mommy and daddy's pride and joy, Marie looks back and says, well, you're wrong about that one because my parents are dead. In fact, I killed them. Jordan doesn't believe that story at all, but Marie goes into details about how it happened and about how, because of it, she never feels like a superhero. This helps Jordan and Kate see Marie in a completely new light. Kate especially knows how she feels. She tells her a story that the first time she realized she had powers was when she told her brother to run away and never come back. And they never found her brother. Her mom, to this day, never touches her. Jordan doesn't have a similar situation. She does, though, feel bad for Marie. They then get interrupted by Andre, who comes over and tells the group, yeah, I think I really screwed up, and it has to do with Emma. They're all kind of confused as to what he's talking about, but Andre, looking at his phone, realizes that Emma hasn't moved in a while. He's worried that she's stuck down in the basement. And he's worried that by telling his dad that he knows about the basement, it's putting Emma in danger. Well, in fact, it is. Because down in the basement, an alarm goes off, and Emma doesn't know what's going on, but Sam certainly does. He knows that they know she's down there. Being as small as she is, she's easily able to hide, and then soldiers come in and electrocute Sam, immobilizing him. Emma wasn't about to sit back and just get found. Like Ant-Man, she hops on the soldier's back, climbs into his ear, and climbs through his brain, killing him. The issue is, that's not the only soldier she's going to have to deal with, because more of them run in the room. In episode four, Sam and Emma were able to escape. They killed all the guards they got out of there. And once the dean realizes that something's up, she heads down there with Dr. Cardoza. Dr. Cardoza is the guy that does all the experiments on Sam. The dean needs to know exactly what happened to these soldiers, and the truth is, he doesn't really know. 
What he does know is that Sam is way stronger than Golden Boy, and they have an issue with Sam being on the run. So far, they have no idea what's going on with Emma, and neither do her friends. Jordan, Kate, Marie, Andre, they all follow the tracking chip, but it goes to just a regular field with a hole in it. At some point, Emma must have ditched it. They start fighting about what might have happened to Emma, with some people like Marie really caring and other people like Jordan only caring about the top five, which just got released and Marie is the new number two. It's not like Jordan doesn't realize that they do have an issue on their hands because at this point they don't know who's in on, quote, the woods, but she also doesn't know how exactly they're going to go about solving this. The kids kind of realize there's nothing they can do in the moment, so they all just head back to campus. When Andre wakes up the next day, the first thing he does is wake and bake, and then he heads to Kate's. He tells her that he doesn't know where Emma is, and he doesn't know exactly what to do. He also reveals to her that he told his dad everything, and his dad's response was, drop it. Kate says, you know, maybe he's trying to protect you, but Andre says no. That's not it. His phone then buzzes, and his reaction to it is not good. And that's because there's a famous alumni on campus. His name is... Tech Knight, and he is basically a human lie detector. He has a hit show on Vault Plus where he goes into crime solving. Well, his next mystery is why exactly Golden Boy offed himself. This isn't just an issue for Andre, who's going to be interviewed by Tech Knight. It's also an issue for the Dean. Because Dean Shetty doesn't want this guy poking around her students and possibly finding out what happened to Sam. At this point, she's still trying to keep the fact that Sam is gone under wraps. The only reason she's even allowing this guy to be on campus is because it's what Ashley wants. Her edict to him was to leave the top five alone, but clearly he's not following that rule because he's interviewing the new number one student. In fairness to Tech, though, Andre was Golden Boy's best friend, and to find out why Golden Boy might have done the thing he did, you would interview his friends. So they've got Andrea scheduled to interview with Tech, Kate to interview with Tech, and also Jordan. But as Jordan is heading to her dorm to get ready for it, she notices that Marie is talking to an absolute creep. But this creep's power is the fact that he is clairvoyant, psychic, all that stuff. And Marie wasn't about to sit back and just not know what happened to Emma. She wants to find her, help her friend. So she reached out to this guy trying to get some help. What she wasn't banking on was that this guy would use his powers to get her into his room. Marie was completely knocked out. She was about to be raped. And it was Jordan who once again comes to save the day. Jordan's able to distract this guy. Marie uses her powers. And she explodes a very delicate... Well, you know, when a guy gets excited and blood rushes to a certain thing... Look, it's not there anymore. It's not there. He's a eunuch at this point. Marie did that. She didn't even know she had that power. Up until this point, she thought she could just control blood when it was outside of the body. But turns out, she can control blood when it's rushing to a certain particular area. Once they get out of this guy's dorm room, the first thing Jordan does is tell Marie what an idiot she is for trusting this guy. And Marie fires back that she's trying to find her friend. If her friend's in danger, she wants to help. The way that Jordan is looking at this, though, is Marie has a great opportunity. She's the new number two. Why would you jeopardize that? And Marie, not giving a rat's ass about rankings, just wants to help her friend. At the very end of their conversation, Jordan gets close to Marie and says, Tech Knight is on campus. If he finds out what you're doing, you'll be lucky if you just end up in prison because he messes with people big time. I mean, he really messes people up. And there's a good example of it in the first interview he does with Andre. Andre is there along with his father, and Tech starts doing his thing, interviewing him, questioning him, but also painting this narrative that's not entirely true. Using his powers, Tech weaves a story that Andre was simply jealous of Golden Boy. He was also sleeping with his girlfriend, which he figured that out, and so the two formulated a plan to kill him. Now, he doesn't do this in a very PC manner. He does it knowing that they can edit out his actual wording of it, but he does it to get a rise out of Andre, and it works. Andre just gets up, puts Tech in his place by saying he is a small human being whose powers suck, and then finally cursing out his dad for putting him in that situation and walking out. 
The interview, though, caused Andre and Kate both to miss the next class, which was Dean Shetty's superhero branding course. Jordan's in that class, and so is Marie. And right before class starts, Dean Shetty walks up to Marie and says, Hey, you didn't stop by today. That's weird because you had been, but I want to talk to you. Your, your roommate, it's Emma, right? The girl that gets small? Have you seen her recently? Marie makes up a horrible, obvious lie and asks, What is this about? And the dean says, I'm just checking in. She missed a few classes, that's all. She then brings in the guest speaker for that day's course. It's none other than Tech. Camera crew and all, he decides to show the students just how to conduct an interview to break the witness. And he decides to use Marie Monroe. Just like with Andre, he's able to use his lie detector skill set to break Marie and get Marie to admit that she really didn't do anything with the Golden Boy situation. It was all Jordan Lee. When the interview's done, Marie, who is absolutely embarrassed at this point, just walks out of class. And when the class is over, Dean Shetty is not happy with Tech. She walks up to him and says, I told you, stay away from the top five. And he tells her, digging for the truth is such a rush. But you were right. These kids, there's nothing there. I can't pin what happened to Golden Boy on any of them. Which, by the way, was the initial plan. No, instead, he's not going to pin it on any of the top five or any of the students. He's going to pin what happened to Golden Boy on the Dean. As he puts it, these kids, they could be big earners for Vaught, but you, you're just a human. She tells him that he has no evidence she did anything wrong, but he knows about Sam. He knows that Sam is gone. And if Vaught found out about that, well, let's just say taking the fall for Golden Boy is the better option. But the Dean's not going to sit back and take that. Yeah, okay, she's not a soup, but her power is blackmail, it turns out. The next day, she decides to meet with Tech in a discreet location in the woods, and Tech thinks that this is going to be a payoff situation, but instead, she shows him a bunch of blackmail. It starts out with the fact that he's got a brain tumor. She found that out, and it's going to be incurable, grow, and kill him eventually. But no, the more embarrassing thing is the fact that maybe because of this brain tumor, he sees a hole, and he's just got to hump it. And I'm talking any hole. Bagels, tree knots, parking cones, you name it, he's humping it. And she's got a bunch of videos showing just that. If those videos were to get out, it would be pretty embarrassing and probably ruin his career. Tech, at this point, realizes he has been defeated. And so the episode that Tech Knight is going to air wraps up with him saying that Golden Boy simply snapped. Now, as for the person who Tech interrogated in a classroom, Marie gets confronted by Jordan in her dorm room. Jordan asks her, what the hell was that back there? And Marie's pretty confused because Jordan wanted Marie to tell the truth the whole time and she finally did, and now Jordan's mad at it? Doesn't really make sense. Jordan fires back, yeah, I wanted the truth, but I also didn't want you to bury yourself in the process. You keep acting stupid, and I know you're not stupid. This segues into them admitting to each other how they're scared of this moment, and then suddenly they hook up. Jordan as a boy, Marie obviously as a girl, she doesn't have that power. It gets interrupted, though, when Emma enters the room. She wasn't expecting to walk in and see that scene, but she came because she needs help. Sam is going after Dr. Cardoza. Now, if you're wondering where Sam and Emma have been this whole time, they went and hid at an abandoned movie theater. During that time, Sam and Emma actually got to know each other a little bit, and Emma likes him a lot. Sam, though, has mental issues. He hears voices, and those voices told him that he needs to hurt the person who hurt him which was Dr. Cardoza. So he went after him to kill him. Emma didn't want that. She needed help stopping him. And Jordan knows where Dr. Cardoza lives. They grab Kate and Andre and they head over to the house. And Sam does have Cardoza and his family terrified. Not wanting Sam to become a murderer, they start trying to talk Sam down. But Sam gets infuriated because he recognizes some of the people. He recognizes Andre and Marie from getting him into this situation and stopping him the last time he escaped. He recognizes Kate from knocking him out. He thinks that what they're going to do is put him back in the woods. And even though they try to explain to him, no, that's not the case. We know who you are and we know the situation now. He's not seeing clearly. He starts fighting all of them. And he is extremely powerful, but 
Jordan actually gets the better of him. Sam, though, is enraged. He's not about to quit. And that's when Emma takes action. Turns out when Emma throws up, yeah, she gets small. When she eats a lot, she gets really big. And a giant Emma walks out of the house and pins Sam down and tries to calm him. She tells him that everything will be all right. They're not going back to the woods. They're in this together. Marie assures Sam that they're going to make this right. She promises. And then it just cuts off to black. And the next thing you know, Marie is in bed with Jordan. Female Jordan this time. Having no recollection of how she got there. In episode 5, Marie wakes up with Jordan in bed having no idea how she got there. But turns out everybody woke up in a similar situation. They have no idea where they are, how they got there, but it looks like they're at a frat house and they just simply drank too much. As Marie is trying to figure out how exactly she got in this situation, both Andre and Kate walk in and see them both in bed and they quickly get out of there. It's awkward for Marie because she doesn't know what exactly her and Jordan even did and before she can really process it, now two of their friends have found out. When they head outside, they find the fifth member, Emma, and she's passed out in the pool. But luckily, Emma ate so much that she's so big, the pool looks like basically a kiddie pool. I mean, she's huge, so she didn't drown. But just like the others, she also has no idea how she got there. Jordan, Kate, and Andre get together and start talking about what might have happened, and all of them agree that they don't black out this long. Because it turns out they didn't just black out through the night, they missed an entire day of their life. Emma and Marie head off to kind of hang out and talk about what might have happened, and as they're discussing it, Sam shows up. He apologizes for everything that happened the previous day, but they have no idea who he is. They just think that he's some fan that saw their videos on TikTok and wants an autograph. That's when Sam realizes they did it to them. They wiped their memory. They start asking Sam if he wants help, and he just explains there are dangerous people at that school. There are people that don't want you to know about me or the truth. I mean, you can't trust anybody. But since neither girl remembers this kid, they go, wait, so we can trust you? Sam tries to jog Emma's memory about the drive-in movie theater, but still, she has no idea what he's talking about. At this point, Sam realizes that this conversation is a waste of time, so he vows to find a way to prove to both of them that what he's saying is true, and then he heads off. Both girls leave really confused, kind of freaked out, and they meet up with Andre, Jordan, and Kate. They mention how they ran into this Sam kid, but nobody really recognizes that name. Kate then says aloud that she has a pretty good idea of who might have wiped their memory and shows them a social media post that features Rufus at the party. If anybody could have wiped their memory, it would have been him. Marie then has to tell everybody what she did to Rufus, you know, blowing up his tail, if you will. But Kate also has a Rufus story, and this one didn't end the way Marie's did, that's for sure. When Kate was a freshman, Rufus raped her. At least that's what she assumes. She woke up with a camera pointed at her and he said, if you make this weird, I'll wipe you again. So she didn't say anything. This is the first time she's ever told anybody the story. And when Andre hears this, he wants to kill Rufus. Kate tries to brush it aside because in reality, she doesn't remember anything that happened between her and Rufus, but she knows it wasn't good. Before they can even formulate a plan on how to get Rufus, Andre is taken off back to campus. Because he's not wasting time. He's going to make this dude pay. As all of them were trying to figure out what happened to them, though, down in the woods, Dr. Cardoza and Dean Shetty were discussing exactly what happened the previous night at Cardoza's house. Cardoza's basically done. He doesn't want to put his family at risk, and he's sick of babysitting psychopaths, as he puts it. Shetty knows that Cardoza doesn't exactly have many options, so she says, what do you want? And Cardoza thinks about it and says, I want Marie. Her powers are like that I've never seen before. I mean, this girl doesn't realize how powerful she really is. So I want her. It could speed up my timeline. Shetty agrees that Marie is extremely powerful and she doesn't realize it, but she says no. She is a benefactor. Marie's off limits. For now. When Dean Shetty leaves the woods, she goes and she has a conversation with, of all people, Rufus. The conversation gets seen by both Jordan and Marie, who, as they were walking, discussed the previous possible actions of the other night. They just chalked it up to them not acting like themselves. But the conversation stops once they see Rufus talking to Dean Shetty, and they chase after him. 
Rufus is able to get away, or at least he thinks. He goes back to his dorm room where Andre is waiting for him. Andre goes to attack him, but Rufus uses his powers to put him under where Andre wakes up in a fast food restaurant, knowing that he screwed up. With Rufus getting away, Marie heads back to her dorm room where she finds a very excited Emma. And that's because Emma is now a social media star after whatever happened at that party. I mean, she's all over TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, and she's even broken the top 100. She's number 88. She's so excited to prove her mom wrong because her mom never thought that this was going to be possible. But she doesn't really want to talk about her. She wants to talk about what's going on with Marie and Jordan. Marie says, yeah, Jordan just said we're cool. I guess they changed their mind. But Emma says, well, did they change their mind or did you change your mind? I mean, come on. It's simple. Do you like Jordan? Do you want to hook up with Jordan? And at this stage, Marie admits she doesn't really know. Emma, however, gets distracted from their conversation because she sees a sweatshirt for the drive-in theater. The same drive-in theater that Sam brought up to them. Suddenly, the girls are thinking that this Sam kid was onto something, that maybe he knows what happened to him. That's when Marie remembers that Rufus was with Shetty. But what they can't figure out is what Shetty would want them to forget. And that's why Emma wants to go find Sam, to hear his side of things. Right before Emma heads out, Marie starts scratching her neck, but because of her power, she notices that there's a blood clot in her neck. And then she realizes that something is in her neck. Using her power, she's able to get whatever it is out of there, and it's a tracking chip. At some point, when they were knocked out and they can't remember what happened, somebody chipped them, expecting them to not find it. Well, Marie did. So Marie heads off to tell the others about the tracking chip, while Emma heads off to go find Sam. And Sam didn't go exactly back to the drive-in. He headed to the sewers. Whatever demons the kid is dealing with get to him, because... He starts imagining puppets coming down from the sky to arrest him, and he starts killing all the puppets. But it wasn't actually puppets. No, he was killing actual soldiers who located his whereabouts and were coming to get him. When Sam is able to snap out of this psychosis, he just has a bunch of dead bodies who are all over the place. And Sam knows he was the one who did it. Sam gets back to the drive-in, and a short while later, Emma does show up. She admits that she doesn't remember him, but she does believe him. Because someone clearly made her forget him. Sam understands and says, that's fine, I get it. She made Luke forget me too. And the she isn't Shetty, it's Kate. Unfortunately for Marie, that's the first person she went to talk to about the tracking chip. After explaining how she found it in her body, she goes to check Kate. But Kate, who isn't wearing gloves, apologizes to Marie and then wipes her memory of the situation. She stumbles out of Kate's dorm room to find Jordan sitting on the ground, having a conversation with their RA, Maverick, who, by the way, happens to be Translucent's son. Jordan was actually talking about the relationship between herself and Marie, but when she saw Marie, she could tell something wasn't exactly right. Marie had this nasty cut on her shoulder, but she doesn't know how she got it. When Jordan brings up Rufus, Marie has no idea why they would chase Rufus. It becomes obvious to Jordan that somebody wiped her memory. Jordan thinks that it was Rufus, wiping her memory for a second time. She walks away, but Marie stops her and says, Wait, I think there's something in your neck. And just like with Marie, there's a tracking chip in there. As both girls are discussing the tracking chips, Kate is having a heart-to-heart with Dean Shetty about how she can't continue to do this anymore. She can't lie to her friends. The guilt is eating at her. Dean Shetty tries to explain that what Kate is doing is the right thing. Because when push comes to shove, Kate is the only one who can keep her friends safe. So Kate really believes that she is doing the right thing. And after having this talk with Dean Shetty, she goes to wipe another brain. This one's going to be Andre's. After wiping his memory, they sit down, they watch the mesmerizer, and then they just chat about how they probably should leave the school. Get out forge their own life because at this point the only reason why Andre is there is because of his dad he doesn't know it but Kate's all for that idea just to get away from Dean Shetty Andre's phone then buzzes and it's Jordan telling him that they found Rufus Marie and Kate confront Rufus but he vehemently denies having anything to do with wiping their memory he tries to stick up for himself pointing out that he couldn't have done it he's been at the same place for five hours but they don't believe him That is, until Emma calls and says, it wasn't Rufus, it was Kate. 
Problem is, nobody ended up relaying that message to Andre, who shows up and throws a keg right at Rufus. Andre's about to kill Rufus, until finally, Jordan and Marie are able to get through to him and say it wasn't him. It was Kate this entire time. And at first, Andre doesn't believe it, but Kate can't deny it anymore. She explains that she just wanted to help and protect him. That's it. She touches his head. A bunch of his memories rush back, like getting knocked out by Sam, the Golden Boy conversation with Tech Knight, the video from Luke, everything. And to that, Andre just shakes his head looking at Kate and says, you're a monster. In episode six, Kate decides to give all of her friends back their memories, and they're mortified, mortified about what she did to them. Emma especially can't believe that she doesn't remember Sam at all. So she leaves all of them to go find him and apologize for what happened. For someone like Andre, he needs to be by himself. He doesn't even want to look at Kate. So Marie goes and tries to calm him down a bit, trying to take Kate's side and say that Kate was being played just like the rest of them. This wasn't necessarily all Kate's fault. Dean Shetty was doing this to her. But at the moment, Andre doesn't want to hear it. He feels like he was played by someone he truly did love. That's when both of them, though, hear a scream for help, and it's coming from Jordan because Kate has collapsed. And it's something that Andre is well aware of, that when Kate uses her powers to a max, she tends to black out. First, it looks like she's having a seizure, but eventually she does wake up. In this instance, though, she's not waking up. And Marie can tell that her heart rate is slowing. Marie, using her powers, is able to steady Kate's heart rate, and then everybody takes her over to the couch to see if she'll wake up. But once she finally does wake up, she disappears. And none of the kids know how that happened. It's not exactly something Kate's known for. Disappearing isn't one of her strengths. It's not even possible, they thought. But yet, she was there one minute, she's gone the next. They then notice that there's something weird going on outside. Bricks are moving. So they head out there. And suddenly, they're not where they were. They're more of like in a wooded area. Not the woods, but just an area. That's when they hear a woman screaming for a little boy. The woman is with a police officer assuring the woman that they've looked all over for this missing child and they can't find him. And that's when a little girl shows up apologizing. And they realize the little girl is Kate. They must be in Kate's memories. Somehow, they got into Kate's head. They don't know how, but yet there she is, as a little girl, the moment where her brother went missing. And all of her friends are able to see just what happened between Kate and her mother, and about how her mother suddenly switched, terrified of Kate, and telling the police, I don't want to be anywhere near her. When little Kate and the police officer walk away, they're replaced by a shocking individual, Soldier Boy. Turns out, Soldier Boy was Kate's imaginary friend, but also her imaginary boyfriend in many, many ways. But Soldier Boy's been in that head for quite some time. He recognizes just about everybody, but he also recognizes the danger they're in. He tells them that Kate, in the real world, is knocked out. And right now, brain synapses are firing off, but blood vessels are also bursting. And if Kate doesn't wake up, then they're not getting out of there. They're stuck in that head forever. He doesn't necessarily know how they're going to do it, but he tells them, you need to figure out a way to wake Kate up, or else you're going to be stuck for a long, long time. As they walk through the woods trying to figure out what their next step is, they come across a window, and when they look inside, there's Kate as a teenager, locked up. They see the first interaction between Kate and Dean Shetty. Kate's mother had locked her up for years, terrified of Kate's powers and what she could do. Shetty was really the first person that came to her and told her it's not her fault. Everything that happened to her brother, but also that her powers are actually a gift. And Dean Shetty could help harness that gift. A teenage Kate needed somebody like Dean Shetty in that moment. And Dean Shetty took advantage of her. She gave Kate a pill that would take away the, quote, voices in her head. And when Kate took it, it worked. The kids suddenly, though, go from the woods outside of a window to a classroom. It's a classroom at God You. And for most of them, it's just a normal classroom. But then Andre sees a very familiar face he wasn't ever expecting to see again. It's Golden Boy. It's the first time that Luke and Kate ever met. But Andre doesn't want to watch this. It's too tough for him. So he gets up to leave. And that's when Luke addresses him. 
up until this point, they didn't realize that the memories could actually see them. They just thought they were a witness, but it turns out they're a participant. At first, Andre tells Luke how much he misses him, but then the conversation turns dark because Luke was aware of the fact that Andre was moving in on Kate. And suddenly, all of the TV screens around the room are filled up with Kate and Andre hooking up. For Marie and Jordan, they had no idea about this. I mean, they're looking at Andre like he's a scumbag. And Andre feels like a scumbag, but he also can't help how he felt in that moment, and he wanted Kate. Luke, however, is enraged. His eyes start to light up. It looks like he's going to use his powers, so the other kids respond, but they realize they don't have any powers in this dream world, so they run. They run right outside of the door to Brink's office. And as they're criticizing Andre for his decision to hook up with his best friend's girlfriend, female Jordan walks right by both of them because there's a commotion going on in Brink's office. Jordan, Andre, Marie, they watch this female Jordan open the door to see Luke ready to attack Brink, calling him a liar. That's when Jordan makes mention of the fact that they're no longer in Kate's memories. Somehow, they're in their memories. Jordan doesn't exactly know how their memories got intertwined with Kate's, but it happened and here they are, watching Jordan save Professor Brink from getting attacked by Golden Boy. They watch as Jordan asked Brink what the issue is, and Brink hit it like Luke could be as powerful as Homelander, but they were giving him certain medications. Sometimes the medication didn't work, so he would act out. But in order to keep her quiet, that's when Brink gave Jordan the TA position. Because just like Shetty with Kate, Brink took advantage of Jordan in that moment, and all of Jordan's friends notice it. To make it worse for Jordan, present-day Jordan has to face the memory of his former self, who reminds him that they could have stopped it all right then and there. All of this could have ended if he just told somebody what Brink was doing, if he stopped it, but he didn't. Suddenly, instead of all of his friends looking at Andre like he's a scumbag, they're now looking at Jordan like they're selfish. And Jordan knows that it was the wrong move. The next stop in the dream scenario is the woods. It's there where Jordan apologizes for everything that happened. But he goes to walk away where he notices that they're doing experimentation in the woods with Luke and with Sam. They see that they're going through a blood transfusion and Luke suddenly wakes up. Dean Shetty and Dr. Cardoza use Kate to knock Luke out and make him forget. And that's when they see all of these memories of Kate time and time again making Luke forget. But all the kids find out that Kate felt really guilty about this. Because the next memory is Kate in a meeting with Dean Shetty and Brink telling them that she doesn't think this is good for Luke. That it's messing with his head. That the dam is about to burst, she can tell. But they just kept assuring Kate that what she was doing was the right move and she was doing good. The dream scenario, though, then turns on them when Dean Shetty tells Kate, make them forget. And the kids realize she's talking about them, so they race out. When they get out to the quad, there's a doorway. And it's a doorway Marie recognizes because it's the door to the bathroom. The same bathroom where both of her parents were killed in. When Marie opens it, she sees her little sister for the first time since the day she was taken away. And she apologizes to her sister. But her sister thinks that Marie did it on purpose. And even though Marie is trying to tell her sister that it was an accident, she didn't know what she was doing, this dream sister doesn't believe it. But unlike the other scenarios where Jordan and Marie had to face their past, Marie uses this example to address Kate and remind her that what she did was not her fault. Just like what happened in that bathroom was not Marie's fault. That's when they finally reach Kate's bedroom where present-day, dream-like Kate is there telling them that they shouldn't be in her brain. And if they want to wake up, they can. They can leave right now, but she's not planning to wake up. For Jordan, he just wants to leave. For Marie, she tries to convince Kate to snap out of this and stay with them. And then there's Andre, and he's pissed. He flat-out tells her he's pissed because he still loves her. After all that she did to him, he still loves her. And that's why he needs her to wake up. And it's Andre's speech that gets Kate to open her eyes, saving the rest of them. When the kids finally snap out of it, they're all really relieved to just be alive. Perfect timing, too, because Emma returns with Sam. She found him in the drive-in, she apologized, and then she took his virginity, which is cool, really cool. 
Emma reintroduces everybody to Sam, but the only person Sam focuses on is Kate because Sam knows exactly what Kate was doing, and he attacks her. Everybody tries to stop him, but Sam is way too powerful, and it takes Emma to calm Sam down. Kate apologizes, telling everybody, I know you don't trust me, and Marie says, yeah, it's going to take a lot for you to earn that. But tell us, what is Shetty doing in the woods? And Kate tells him, I don't know, but they were using Sam to augment Luke's powers. But they were also doing other stuff to him, too. And other kids. That's when Sam chimes in that they were doing some really bad stuff down there. It's all Shetty. She hates us. Kate backs this up by saying that it was Shetty who was directing it all. So now they know who they have to go after. It's Dean Shetty. Marie reminds everybody, if we do this, there's no going back. But they're all in agreement. They're going to go after Dean Shetty and they're going to get some answers. They better hurry, though. Because earlier that day, Dean Shetty met with Dr. Cardosa, and he was really excited. The thing that he had been working on was a virus for soups to take away their powers. He injected one girl with the virus two days ago, and now she's got flu-like symptoms. He thinks it's finally ready to be brought to Vaught. Dean Shetty, though, said no. We're not bringing it to the suits. Up the dose and see how sick you can make her. So Cardoza did what he was told. He upped the dose, and it killed her. He didn't up the dose much either. But this girl went from flu-like symptoms to dead real fast. Cardoza, he's freaking out. They just killed a kid. But Shetty, she gets excited over the possibility and asks him, can you make it contagious? In episode 7, Dr. Cardoza does as he's told. He makes the virus more contagious. And it's bad. I mean, this thing, if it gets out, would likely wipe out soups and make their life and death really, really painful. It's not fun. And because of that, he's conflicted. He doesn't want to go forward with this. But Dean Shetty not only wants to make it more contagious, she wants to make this thing airborne. She wants all of the soup population to eventually get it. Dr. Cardozo doesn't want to have that blood in his hands, so he mentions getting Vaught involved. But Dean Shetty reminds him, you're the one who invented this. I mean, this is your pet project. How would Vaught feel about that? Let's not get Vaught involved. Let's just finish what you started. She has to walk away from Cardoza because she gets a phone call from Kate. And Kate tells her she really, really needs to talk to her at the moment. But Dean Shetty says, crap, I have a meeting in the city I can't get out of. Just go to my house, lay low, and I'll meet you back there. By the way, did you take your medicine? And Kate tells her, yeah. Dean Shetty says, great, take another one, it'll make you feel better, I'll be there soon. But Kate was actually at a diner with Jordan, Marie, and Andre. They were trying to set something up because this was all orchestrated and part of a plan that Kate wanted to do to get back in the good graces of her friends. Kate fills everybody in on what happened with the Shetty conversation, but nobody believes her. And she knows this because she can read their minds and she can tell that none of them believe her. Because of that, Andre is going to go with her. But the group as a whole is really frustrated about the situation. Tensions are high, especially with Jordan. Marie has to remind Jordan, we need Kate. She's the only way to get Shetty to expose the woods. But Jordan has another idea. He's Shetty's TA. He's got the key to her office. And with Shetty in the city all day, he feels like he can sneak into her office and get the proof that they need to expose the woods. And Marie likes the idea, but... She knows that because it's coming from them, no one's going to believe them. What they need to do is get it in the hands of somebody who they will believe. And it just so happens that that certain somebody is coming to campus. It's Victoria Newman. She's doing a town hall. The two then head off to Shetty's office to get the proof that they need. They start snooping around in different files. But there's one interesting file that they find. It's a whole file on transatlantic flight 37. That was the plane that Queen Maeve actually wanted to save everybody, but Homelander decided against it, and the plane was destroyed. They claimed that there was terrorists. Well, it turns out that Dean Shetty's husband and her 11-year-old daughter were on that plane, and that is the motivation behind what she's doing. Of course, Marie and Jordan, they don't know exactly what happened on the plane, and before they can really dive into the file, they hear the door opening, so they have to hide. And it was Dr. Cardoza coming in to drop a file off on Dean Shetty's desk. But he's also drunk and venting. Having no idea that Marie or Jordan are hiding, he starts talking aloud. Just venting to nobody about the Shetty situation, but 
He couldn't pick worse words for these two girls to hear. He starts out by saying, you want me to increase the viral infection rate. Killing them all, she says. Yeah, sign my own death certificate. It's all these little pieces of the puzzle that leave both Marie and Jordan with enough ammo to go to Victoria Newman and say, hey, something's going on. Now, while those two were trying to find proof of the woods, Kate and Andre headed to Shetty's house to lay low. Andre is still really hurt about what Kate did, but it's not like he wants to stay mad at her. They turn on the TV because they've got some time to kill, and they're pretty surprised because Andre's dad, Pilardi, is on the TV. He's going to be hosting the town hall with Victoria Newman, and it's something that Andre had no idea about. And Kate's really surprised about that, that he was left in the dark. She says, didn't your dad tell you he was doing this? And Andre has to come clean that him and his dad haven't talked since he mentioned the woods and his dad tried to shut him down. But then, all of a sudden, that TV interview goes sideways. Polardi seems to have a seizure live on air and Andre gets really, really concerned. The feed goes dark, but Andre's close enough to campus where he knows where his dad is. So he rushes, and he gets there just in enough time to see his dad getting loaded into the ambulance. So, of course, Andre jumps in there with him. But as Pilardi is having these seizures, he's inadvertently bringing all this metal inside, basically turning the ambulance into an implosion device. And Andre is doing his best to not allow that to happen, but it's really difficult because Pilardi is really strong. So because of this, Pilardi's not going to be able to host that town hall meeting. Amazingly, one person in attendance is Sam, who was hiding out in Emma's dorm room, but when she left to go get him some food, curiosity got the best of him. He heard some commotion outside, and he ended up linking up with a couple other students, one of them being Rufus. Sam, at this point, is so gullible that he kind of just believes anything. So when Rufus tells him that Emma is going to be at this party, Sam just buys it. And they don't go to a party. They go to this town hall meeting. And Rufus is one of the anti-Victoria Newman people. Because Newman tries to point out that soup lives matter, but everybody's life matters. With a lot of the student body feeling like because they're soups, they're more important. Needless to say, the town hall gets a little feisty and they have to get Victoria Newman out of there. As security is trying to usher her out, Marie, who is able to sneak into the building, gets her attention by saying, there's something I have to tell you. And Victoria recognizes Marie right away as the guardian of Godalkin, so she's more than happy to sit down and chat. When they get alone, though, Marie's not able to even get into the topic because Victoria is doing such a good job at complimenting her, mainly on her power and how it's so cool, mentioning how she can sense things in others that other people can't. And she challenges Marie to do that with her, and when Marie does it, she realizes that there's compound V coursing through Victoria Newman's veins. That's when Victoria reveals to Marie her superpower is the exact same. She can control blood. She also tells Marie that it was her who got Marie into Godalkin in the first place. Because she had been where Marie was, she knew the deck was stacked against her and she wanted to help her out. All of this being a lot for Marie to take in. But Victoria finally asks, what did you want to talk to me about? And that's when Marie tells her all about the woods. She even brings up Dr. Cardoza saying, you can go ask him. You have to bring up what Vaught is doing here. Victoria tells her she'll handle it and that Marie should just go back to being a student. But Marie can't. And Victoria has to slap her out of it, saying, this is your one shot at controlling your life. Because when you go to Red River, you don't have a shot to get out. This is it. You want to make change? Get into the seven. That's how you make change. Being the guardian Godalkin, that's nothing. That's a PR gimmick. But if you make waves now, Vault's going to do nothing but ship you off to the adult facility. Victoria then leaves and Marie checks her phone and she's got a message from Kate saying, come to Shetty's. Shortly after Andre left, Shetty did show up. That meeting that she had in the city, it was with Grace Mallory. Shetty figured that Grace, being anti-soup, was the perfect person to team up with to get this virus out there. She came to Mallory because she knows that Mallory knows where to find all the soups, even the ones that Vaught doesn't know about. And she wants to neutralize soups once and for all. But Mallory isn't about to do that. She tells Shetty, what you're doing is a war crime. Shetty, though, starts arguing that they are in a war. Mallory tells Shetty that there's a guy that works for her who has the same rage towards soups. It's consumed him so much that there's basically nothing left of him. And she warns Shetty that she doesn't want to go down that road. So just 
take this virus and get rid of it. Of course, Dean Shetty doesn't really have any plans on doing that and walks away from Grace pretty unsatisfied. Once she's out of earshot, Grace pulls out her cell phone and asks the person on the other end, did you get all that? All right, well, keep an eye on her. Once Shetty got back to her house and talked to Kate, she realized that Kate hadn't been taking her medication and Kate's mood had completely changed. Kate then sent that group chat to everybody. Now, with Andre busy with his dad in the hospital, Marie, Jordan, Emma, who finally found Sam, and Sam all head over to Shetty's place. They're pretty surprised because when they walk into the living room, there's Kate and Shetty. But Kate lets them know that using her abilities, she's now controlling Shetty. And she tells Shetty, tell them what you told me. Shetty tells all of them that Godolkin was built by a scientist who was tasked with trying to find out what makes soups tick. These kids aren't here to study. The school is there to study them. She then brings up the virus and admits that she wants this thing to spread across the globe. And the reason for that is because Homelander killed her entire family on that plane. And she's out for revenge. The Homelander revelation shocks the entire room. But they also don't feel like they should be being punished because of what he did. And Shetty is painting with a broad brush. She also tells him that her last assignment for Kate was to kill everybody in the woods. And Jordan says, oh my god, did you do that? And Kate says, no, I'm trying to prove to you that I'm on your side. Don't you guys see? We have to strike first. Starting with her. Now, Shetty begs for her life, but it doesn't matter. Kate says, it's time. And Shetty pulls up a meat cleaver that's been sitting there. All the kids are begging Kate to make it stop, but she doesn't. And Shetty cuts her own throat. Jordan jumps into action, trying to get the blood to stop. And Marie could make it stop with her powers, but Kate won't allow it. A few seconds later, it's clear that Dean Shetty is dead. And Marie asks, Kate, do you know what you've done? And Sam says, justice because sam he's on kate's side but while the kids were finding out the truth victoria newman was busy getting the virus she covertly met with dr cardoza and he handed it over telling her that all he asked was him and his family be taken care of he didn't want to be hunted down by vaught and she assured him that that would be the case but once she got possession of the virus using her powers his head went pop and now the virus belongs to victoria newman And in the season finale, right away, Kate can tell just by reading their minds that they are not pleased with what she decided to do. And she pleads her case, saying that for once, she's going to be a hero. But to people like Jordan and Marie and Emma, Kate's not a hero. She just murdered somebody. In fact, the only person in the room that agrees with what Kate did is Sam, because he looked at Shetty as a monster. So you've got two factions. You've got the Marie, Jordan, and Emma faction, and then you've got the Kate and Sam faction. And these two factions split up with Kate telling the group, I'm going to go free the woods, and Sam being a part of it wanting to help her. Now, Emma does step in and try to save Sam because he is so gullible, and she doesn't want anything to happen to him, but Sam just tells her, you know, I think it's time that I save you for once. Once Sam and Kate do leave, The other three realize that they're going to have to stop them before they do something really, really dumb. A little while later, though, Kate has freed the woods. Because she knew all the guards from doing Shetty's bidding, she was able to easily get down there, and then she let Sam take it away from there. One by one, they killed the guards, and one by one, they freed the rooms. But it was in the last room that they really saw the damage of what the virus was doing. And it was in the last room that Kate really rallies the troops and gets them on her side by reminding them that they are superior to regular humans. With Kate's message ringing in their ears, once the kids finally do get freed from the woods, they go on the attack, attacking anybody who isn't a soup. It puts the campus in a complete frenzy, with many students and faculty running for their lives because they just don't know what's going on. One of the faculty that almost dies is the director turned acting coach. When Sam walks in, interrupts his class, the director has no idea who Sam is, so he just starts criticizing him, and that's when Sam starts to choke him. He's going to kill him, but Emma tries to stop him. At this point, Emma, Marie, Jordan, they've all shown up on campus, and they're trying to get a handle on the situation. And Emma, having been able to talk Sam off a ledge before, 
tries to do the same thing, but this time it doesn't go well. They get into a huge argument where things get said that will not be forgotten. Emma yelling at Sam, I want what's best and you know that. And Sam countering with, you want what's best for you. When Emma points out that she risked everything for Sam, Sam tells her, you would do anything to be liked. You're not a hero. And then he walks out, leaving Emma just sitting there, thinking about what he just said, crying. And then a few seconds later, she realizes, oh, crap, I'm, I'm small. Because whatever happened, whatever emotional release just went down, it caused Emma to be able to use her powers to become small again. Now, as soon as Sam left the classroom, he ran into Kate. And the first question he asks is, is what we're doing right? And the one person who definitely doesn't think it's right is Sam's brother. Because Golden Boy is standing right behind Kate, trying to convince his brother that this isn't him. What these people are doing, it's not who he is by nature. But Kate, she's spinning that lie. Telling Sam that what they're doing is holding guilty people accountable. Golden Boy tries to remind Sam that it's actually Sam who's the one who's imagining him. Which means that it's Sam who doesn't want to do this. He pleads with Sam to take advantage of this moment. Be a hero. But Sam just shakes his head and says, You said you were me, but trust me. I hate myself. He then asks for Kate's help. And she touches his face and says, feel nothing. And now Sam is once again ready to do her bidding. Marie, however, is going to try to take steps to make sure that that doesn't happen. One of them being that there's a button in Shetty's office. So she knows that something happens when you press it. And she does. And it puts the school on lockdown. Once Marie starts to leave Shetty's office and try to formulate the next part of her plan, she gets a phone call from Ashley. It turns out this was really bad timing, but Ashley and... Most of the other higher-ups at the school were currently in a meeting at Godalkin discussing who they were going to put in the seven. As they were doing that, all hell broke loose, and they're terrified. So Ashley tells one of her minions to go get the helicopter so they can get out of there, contact Homelander so he can stop it. But in the meantime, she makes a phone call to Marie telling her, hey, great news, you're going to be a new member of the seven. We just need you to stop what's going on here. Marie's response, though, isn't exactly what Ashley was expecting. She doesn't jump at it. And Ashley, who is very frustrated, says, Look, the entire board of trustees is up here. If you do this, I'll get you a meeting with your sister. Now, that is a way better offer for Marie than joining the Seven. When she walks outside to see the damage and figure out what her next move is, she sees the helicopter that Ashley called, but it's crashing. One of the soups decided to take it out. And this thing would crash and burn, if it wasn't for Andre. Now, Andre's had a really, really rough day. Up to this point, he had been at the hospital with his father, where he learned from the doctor that his dad didn't have a heart attack or stroke. His dad had a seizure because every time his dad uses his powers, it creates a small tear in his brain. And if he keeps using his powers, he's going to eventually die. Well, since Andre and his dad share powers, it's pretty concerning. And when Andre walks back in the room and tries to tell his dad... Our powers are killing us. His dad just cuts him off and tells him, now's your time. Yeah, I knew about the school and I didn't say anything, but the school, that's done for. Now's the time for you to join the seven. Now's the time for you to put on that suit and be a hero. It's kind of conflicting for Andre, who, yeah, wants to be a hero, but also doesn't want to die. And as he was sitting there thinking about it, he got a phone call from Kate, begging him to join her. Kate let him know that Shetty was dead and they were taking over the school and that she does truly love him. And all he has to do is join by her side. But all Andre heard was that Shetty was dead and they were taking over the school. So he headed there to see what was going on. That's when he saw the helicopter going down. And even though he shouldn't, he used his powers to stop it. The first person he sees, though, after saving the helicopter isn't Kate. It's actually Marie. And right away, Marie is able to get Andre on her side by saying, look, It's bad right now, but let's be the Guardians of Godalkin. They run through a very hectic campus, and they do find Kate, but she looks horrible. Her eyes are all bloodied, and Andre asks, how are you pushing so hard? And Kate tells him that it was Shetty's medication. It wasn't helping me, it was limiting me. Marie begs Kate to stop this, mentioning how Vault wants Kate to kill her. But instead of stopping, 
Kate grabs Maverick, Translucent's son, and using her powers, she says, stop her. And now Maverick's only mission is to keep Marie from getting to Kate at all costs. With Marie getting beat up by a guy that she can't see, Kate takes off running and Andre goes right after her. When he finally catches up to her, she says, what do you want? And he says, I want whatever is going to get us out of this mess. Whenever we do something on our own, it gets pretty screwed up. But I know that when we do stuff together, we do some amazing, amazing stuff. Whatever's happening right now, we can figure this out. But Kate has no interest in joining sides with Andre. And once he realizes that, he gets hit really hard by Sam. Sam and Andre start getting into it, but it ends with both of them on the ground, having taken out each other. Luckily, though, Marie was able to take out Maverick. Remembering what Newman said about using her powers to sense things, she was able to just feel Maverick's heartbeat, and while he was invisible to everybody else, she could see the blood coursing through him. So at one point, Maverick ran at her, and Marie was able to smash him in the head and knock him out. She then gets run up on by Kate, and they both start pleading their case on why what they're doing is the right move. But as they're trying to make this case, Marie notices that Jordan is getting attacked by one of the kids from the woods. She knows she has to act quickly because not only will Jordan die, but also Ashley, the director, and the rest of the board of trustees, they're also going to die. So Marie, using her powers, takes the blood of everybody else around her who has died and uses that to take out the kids from the woods. It seems like at this point the guardians of a Godolkin have gotten the job done, but they're wrong. Because when Marie looks over at Jordan and Jordan is smiling back at Marie, she sees that Kate is trying to get to Jordan to touch Jordan because Kate has still not given up hope on completing this mission. When Marie sees this, though, she jumps into action to try to stop Kate, but she still hasn't harnessed her powers quite enough. And what ends up happening is Kate's arm blows off. Not exactly what Marie intended. Marie, though, doesn't really even have time to apologize to Kate because in flies Homelander. He right away starts surveying the landscape, and what he sees is all of these soups lying on the ground, either dead or unconscious, and then Marie and Jordan standing there, perfectly fine, with Kate grabbing the stub of her arm. So Homelander's not in the mood for pleasantries. He asks Marie what kind of animal she is because she was attacking her own, and then he decides to take her and Jordan out. A little while later, Marie ends up waking up in a hospital along with Jordan, Emma, and Andre in a room that they can't get out of because there's no doors. And the narrative is no longer that she's the guardian of Godolkin, but instead that those four went on a massacre and it was Sam and Kate who were now the guardians of Godolkin, having saved everybody. But it's not all bad news because help is on the way. While the woods were in fact freed, that doesn't mean they're empty. Because Billy Butcher has shown up. And that is the end of Season 1 of Gen V. Thank you so much for getting this part of the recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you like this. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. Go buy a shirt. Go buy a mug. That'd be cool. You know what isn't cool? Being a dick in the comments section. If I messed up, hey, it happens, right? Just move on. I'm insecure. Nasty comments make me feel bad. But if you are still listening, just know I do appreciate that.